So that's a tutorial slide for today. Yeah. So in the first part, I'm just going to be summarizing the materials we introduced in the lecture last week. That was for the forward and um, futures market, right, and options as well. So here we go. Let's go through it. So you will find that some of these materials are relevant for your assignment as well. So uh, before I start, um, so if you haven't done derivatives before, um, it could be a little bit tricky to get around. So I prepared these slides to help you with understanding the basics of futures, forward and options. So for our subject, we would only use, um, we will just look at the applications of these, con um, these contracts. Yeah, So we don't have to worry about the technicality of it. We just have to worry about the application. Okay. If you have done a derivative subject before, you'll find that this is very um, familiar, okay? Um, but it's good to also revise these concepts because they are quite tricky. So what's relevant for our subject? Now, we need to understand what these contracts do because for a lot of the time in our subject, we will use them to uh, hedge our positions, okay? So forward futures and option contracts are contracts that allow you to fix the price of a currency for a future delivery, right? So for example, if you expect to receive a million USD um, from your trade partner in three months time, um, and you don't want to bear any foreign exchange rate exposure, right? So you would be using one of these contracts to hedge your position, okay? So for your assignment, question two is about hatching a position using the forward contract, okay? So you need to understand the forward contract for your assignment. So with forward and um, futures, um, you could enter into a long or a short position. We'll talk about that later on. With futures contract, you would also need to understand the marking to market process, yeah? So the daily settlement process, so an example that we went through in the lecture was that we saw that when the prices change every day, um, your profits or loss would also change and that will affect your, uh, your account balance, okay? So this is a key distinction between futures and forward, okay? With the option contract, it's a bit more complex. So for the purpose of the assignment, you don't need to worry about options yet. But for later parts of the subject, you will need to understand options, okay? So with options, you have call and put, and you have long and short, as well as European and American, okay? Now, um, sometimes you could get, um, it's very e easy to get confused between long and short options and long and short forward, okay? So with um, options, um, calls and puts would be similar to long and short in forward, but long and short in options are something else, okay? So it's a bit different. We'll talk about that later on, but just bear that in mind, okay? So with forward and futures, um, these contracts have the same sort of agreement. So they are both agreements to buy or sell foreign currency in the future at a price that you agree on today, okay? So in terms of their payoff functions, um, it's very similar, okay? So when you agree to sell a foreign currency in a forward or a futures contract, this is when you are short, okay? Um, when you agree to buy um, a currency under forward or futures contract, this is when you are long, okay? So these are the two graphs that we introduced in the lecture last week. And these are for long and short forward positions, okay? Can someone tell me what the left-hand side graph is about? Is it a long or a short position? And similarly for the right-hand side, okay? So if I'm looking at the left-hand side here, am I looking at a long or a short forward contract? Someone tell me, someone tell me what it is. So here, every time when the market price increases, I make a gain. But when the market price decreases below my forward rate, I make a loss, okay? 
in my long or in my short. So on the left hand side, I'm looking at the long forward position. Okay. So in this case, I agree to buy the foreign currency at the rate of F. Okay. So this is the price that I agree to buy at for a future delivery. Okay. So now this is the price I agree to buy at. So every time when the market rate increases, so ST is the spot price for the same currency um, in the future. Okay. So what I'm saying here is when the future market price is very high, this is when other people in the market without a forward contract will be buying the currency at. So as you can see, they are buying the currency at a higher price, okay? That means I am better off relative to them. I'm just going to use here as my example. So that means I'm better off relative to them because I get to buy the currency at a lower rate, okay? So in this case, because I'm better off relative to them, um, my profit function is a positive number, okay? So for a long position, Every time when SD is higher than F, you are better off relative to everyone else. In contrast, if the market is here, so the future spot rate is here, so everyone else in the market would be buying the currency at a lower rate, whereas I will be buying the currency at a higher rate. Okay. So in this case, I am worse off, and therefore my payoff function would be negative. Okay. So when you have a long contract, you're looking at an upward training line. So on the right hand side, I've got a short position. Okay. So in this case, my payoff function is F minus SD. Okay. So what am I interpreting um, the payoff function as? Now with the short forward position, I agree to sell the currency at F, right? So I lock in my sale at F and this is the future spot rate, okay? So if the future spot rate is higher, that means in the future, for people that do not have a short position in forward, they get to sell the currency at a, sorry, this is lower price. I'm talking about higher price. So for people that have, um, for people that don't have a forward contract in the future, they get to sell their currency at a higher rate. Whereas because I already lock in my price at F, which is lower than the market, um, I basically sell my currency at a lower rate. Okay. So here I'm worse off relative to other people. So with a short position, every time when the future spot rate is higher than F, I will have a worse off position. So my payoff is negative. Okay. In contrast, if the future spot rate decreases, I will find that I'm better off rel relative to everyone else because I get to sell the currency at the higher rate. Okay. So if ST is less than F, I will get a positive payoff. Okay. So this is something you need to understand for your assignment as well. Okay. So um, in terms of the assignment, this is particularly relevant. Okay. So depending on which homework set you have, you either would be answering question one or question two. Okay, so in question one, if I owe a foreign currency in the future, and if I want to hedge, do I want to go long or do I want to go short? Okay. In the second question, if I expect to receive money from my foreign partner in the future, and I want to hedge this exposure, do I go long or do I go short? Okay. So this is discussed in the lecture last week. So if you um, refer back to the lecture, you'll be able to answer these two questions, okay? So you need to get this right for your assignment, okay? In the two homework sets, um, you've got two different positions, okay?
All right, so we also talk about the futures market and basically with the futures contract, um, as we mentioned before, the payoff would be exactly the same as the forward contracts, okay? So when you have a long futures, you're looking at this payoff function here. When you have a short futures, you're looking at this payoff function here, okay? What is a performance bond in the futures market? So as we mentioned before, with, excuse me, so with futures contracts, they are traded in the market, yeah? So before you're allowed to trade, you need to deposit a performance bond to your broker. And your performance bond is basically your margin account, okay? So you, you deposit a percentage of your position size and that will allow you to trade futures, okay? What is the maintenance level? So when we say maintenance level, this is the minimum account balance that you need to hold in your account, okay? Whenever your account goes below this maintenance level, you will get a margin call, in which case you need to make sure that you have enough money to top up your account to the performance level, okay? So this feature is the distinction, the main distinction between your futures contract and your forward contract, okay? With forward contract, you are allowed to hold your position until the end and settle the position with your counterparty, okay? With futures contract, you need to update your account every day, okay? So this is to make sure that the exchange does not accumulate losses um, over time, okay? We also talk about options. Now with options, um, it's important to understand that a long option position and the short option position is not the same as long and short forward, okay? So when you say long an option, that means you're buying the option. So you're buying the right to exercise the option against the short position, okay? So for long option positions, it's very similar to an insurance in the sense that first to enter the position, you need to pay a premium, okay, to the short position. Now, with this premium, so once you pay a premium, it allows you to um, decide whether to exercise the contract or not, okay? So an option is a contract where the holder of the option or the long position has the right to exercise the contract or not, okay? So this is similar to say a car insurance where you pay premiums every month. And then if you have an accident, you can claim against your car insurance, okay? So when we have option contracts, we talk about in the money and out of the money, yeah? So in the money options are options where it's profitable for you to exercise, okay? Out of the money options are when it's not profitable for you to exercise and therefore you should just leave the option worthless, okay? So for the purpose of our subject, we don't really worry too much about the short positions. Now with the, uh, so for our subject, we're talking about foreign exchange rate risk management, okay? So this is from the point of view of a corporation who has um, a position and they need to protect the position, okay? So normally for these people, they tend to stick to the long option contracts. For short option positions, this is similar to an insurance company, okay? So when you have a short position, you will charge people the premium and in exchange you need to stand there and ready for people to exercise the option against you okay so you don't have the of the uh, flexibility hang on someone have the chat box here i'm just going to check my chat box uh yep thank you Umate. sorry i didn't see your message before but you're spot on Alrighty, so with the short options, um, you, you don't have the flexibility, but instead you're providing the flexibility to the long position, okay? So this is similar to a financial institution who wants to provide insurance um, 
services, okay? So if we look at the payoff function for options, um, let's look at call options first. With call options, these are options to buy, okay? So when you have a long call option, this is when you have an option to buy a currency at a fixed rate for the future, okay? For future delivery. So with options, we denote the price in the contract as, a, as the exercise price. So we say it's E. So if you long a call option, you need to pay a premium and let's denote that premium C0. So for a long call option, um, the payoff function is provided here. So what we have here is that we have two parts to the option payoff, okay? So the left-hand side is when the option is not, uh, is out of the money. So it's not good for the option holder to exercise, okay? On the right-hand side, this is when the option is in the money. So this is when you should exercise your option, okay? So if you have a um, contract that allows you to buy the currency at a fixed rate of E, then if you look at the right-hand side, this is an upward um, trend, right? Upward sloping trend. So this is similar to to a long position in forward, okay? So similar to long forward. So on the right hand side, your payoff would be ST minus E, okay? So whenever the future spot rate increases, um, you'll be better off. So your payoff would be positive, okay? So when ST is higher than E, you should always exercise the option because your payoff is positive, okay? Now to the right-hand side, sorry, to the left-hand side, this is when your ST is lower than E, okay? So if the future spot rate turns out to be lower than your exercise price, um, you don't want to exercise this option, yeah? Because if you do, you will make a loss, okay? So in this case, I do not want to exercise my option. So I will just leave the option um, expired without doing anything. So in that case, if I leave my option expired without doing anything, the option becomes worthless, okay? So for an option um, payoff, therefore, um, I can write my option payoff as here. So with a long call option, my payoff function would have two components. The first one is here, maximum between zero and ST minus E, okay? So how do I read this number? So every time when ST is higher than E, I would exercise the option and I will earn a positive payoff, okay? So this is when ST is higher than E. In contracts, every time when ST is lower than E, then E, sorry, I will not exercise and therefore I just leave the option worthless, okay? Now we haven't taken into account the option premium yet, okay? So regardless, regardless of how the future looks like, um, when I buy the option, when I enter into a long option position, I will have to pay a premium upfront, okay? So as a result for my payoff function, I'm gonna introduce a fixed cost variable, which is minus C0, okay? So it doesn't matter what happens in the future, I will have to pay a fixed cost of C0, okay? For the short call position, um, it's the blue line here on my graph. So what we see here is that because the short call, the short position is the counterparty of the long position, so their payoff function should be the opposite, right, of the long call position, okay? Which means the short call should be the long call minus one, um, times minus one, okay? So it would be minus the long call. 
So that will be minus max minus C0, okay? So if I um, rearrange, I will get this equation over here, okay? For the short code position. With the put option, um, it's similar to before, we're gonna have a long and a short put. Now with put options, these are options to sell the currency, okay? So we sell the currency at a fixed rate of E for a future delivery, okay? So on the left-hand side, this is when my option is profitable, okay? So this is when it's in the money. On the right hand side, this is when it's not profitable. Okay, so it's out of the money. So on the left hand side, this is when ST is lower than E. If this is the case, my option is profitable, right? So my payoff function here is E minus ST. Okay, this is similar to a short forward payoff function. Okay. So I sell the option at E and everyone else sell at the lower rate, okay? And that's why I'm better off relative to the market, okay? On the right-hand side, this is when it's not profitable for me to exercise, okay? So if I exercise the option, I'm going to make a loss. So in this case, when SD is higher than E, I will just leave the option worthless so my payoff is zero, okay? So therefore, if I write my payoff function, it will be max zero um, and E minus ST, okay? Now, similar to the call, the long call before, with a long put option, I have to pay a premium, which is a fixed cost of P zero. So in my payoff function, I would therefore take my overall payoff and I deduct the cost of the option, okay, which is P0. With the short put option, it will be exactly the opposite to the long put. So I'm just going to take the long put um, at times minus one, okay. So this will be the payoff for my short put, okay. So with the option contracts, um, we will revise, I mean, we'll revisit this concept later on when we um, talk about hatching different positions, okay? So in terms of using derivatives, um, people could use derivatives for hatching, and this is what your assignment is about, right? So you have a position in the spot market, which is the foreign currency market, and you enter into the forward market to hatch that position, okay? For... Um, for some traders, they can use um, derivatives to also speculate, okay? So the key difference between a hatcher and a speculator is that the hatcher has a position that they need to protect and the speculator does not have any position, right? They just want to enter into the market to bet on their expectation about the future, okay? Other considerations, so given that we have three different types of derivatives, um, futures, forward, and options, which one do we use, right? So there are a few considerations that we need to think about. With futures and forward, for example, these are contractual. That means you have to honor the contract regardless of how the market moves, okay? So sometimes you may gain and sometimes you might lose, okay? With options, because you have an option to exercise the option or not. Um, if the market moves in your favor, you will exercise, okay? In contrast, if the market moves against you, you can choose to not exercise the option, okay? So in theory, you have um, exposure to unlimited gain, but you don't, um, you cap your loss at a certain amount, okay? Um, but with options, because it's more flexible, you need to pay a premium. So there is an upfront cost for option hedging strategies relative to futures and forward, okay? 
So that is it for the lecture last week. Any questions so far or are we happy to move on to the tutorial? If we are happy to move on, I will go back to the tutorial slide. Okay. Alrighty. So in this tutorial, um, I'm assuming you guys can see the screen, right, for the tutorial. So with the tutorial questions, um, in the lecture last week, we went through a few tutorial questions as examples, okay? So these are the easy questions, like question one or two, um, question four and eight, when we calculated the forward discount or premium, okay? So given the time constraint, I'm just going to focus on question three, five, and six for um, the half an hour we have, okay? So with question three, this is essentially question four in the textbook. Um, this is quite a straightforward question. So we're given the um, exchange rate between the euro and the USD for the spot market as well as for three different forward contracts, okay? Now, what we are asked to calculate here is um, from the outright forward rate, we need to convert it into the forward points, okay? So what do we mean by forward points? It's basically the difference between your forward rate and your spot rate, okay? So for example, for the one month maturity, if I want to calculate the forward point for the one month maturity, on the bid side, I'm going to take this rate, so 1.3432, I'll minus the spot bid rate, which is here. And my difference here is 0 0.001. This is one basis point, okay? For the ask rate, I'm going to take this rate on the right hand side. I'm going to minus the ask rate for the spot market. Okay. I will get 0 0.0006. Okay. So to write it properly in terms of uh, forward point quotation, I'm going to write this small figure. Okay. So it will be 0 0.1, 0 0.6 for the one month maturity. Okay. So if I do the same thing for the other two maturities, I will find that these are my corresponding forward point quotation. Okay. So this is just the difference between this number and this number in basis points. Okay. So on and so forth. Any questions so far with question three? If not, I'm going to move on to the next question. So questions five and question six are quite similar. Um, but I think question six, we've got a few more questions, a few more small questions. So let's go through question six first. And if we have time, we can go back to question five. Okay. So I'm just skipping through to question six here, which is question 11 in your text, okay? So let's look at this question first. Now, assuming that you are a trader with Deutsche Bank, from the quote uh, screen on your computer terminal, you notice that uh, Dresdner Bank is quoting a price of um, 0.7627 euro per dollar, okay? So this is the euro over USD quote, okay? So with Dresna, which is my first bank, um, they are trading the uh, euro versus USD pair, okay? My second bank is Credit Suisse. So Credit Suisse is trading the Swiss franc and the USD, okay? 
What else do I have? Um, I also have a third bank, which is USB. Sorry, UBS. Um, they are trading the franc and the euro. So they trading the euro and the Swiss franc. Okay. So these are the three banks that I observe from my terminal. The question here is given the rates that they quote for these exchange rates, um, is there any triangular arbitrage that I can take advantage of? And if I have 5 million USD to start with, how can I devise a strategy to earn an arbitrage profit? Okay, provided that there is one. Second question, what happens if you initially sell the dollar? So this is the US dollars for the Swiss franc. Okay. Last question, what exchange rate euro versus franc will eliminate the triangular arbitrage? Okay. So these are the three questions we're dealing with in this question. Okay. So with a triangular arbitrage question, the first thing you need to do is you need to determine whether you have an arbitrage opportunity or not. Okay. So to do so with triangular arbitrage, you need to work out a cross rate first. Okay. Now, given that the third question asked me about the euro versus franc exchange rate, um, to be efficient for the first question, I'm going to start with that exchange rate as well. Okay. So I'm going to start the first question with calculating the cross rate euro versus um, Swiss franc from the first two quotes. Okay. So a note about arbitrage strategy is that when we say arbitrage, we mean we want to identify mispricing. That means we want to trade one single asset that is priced differently in two different places. Okay. So we have one single asset and we have two different prices in two different markets. Okay. So in this case, let's first calculate the cross rate between the euro and the franc. And then I'll tell you why later on. Okay. So our first task in solving this problem is to compute the cross rate euro and franc. Okay. We have done this before. Now, can you guys spend about 30 seconds to solve this problem for me? Can you guys calculate the cross rate euro and franc from the first two rates that we have in, in the question? All right. So from these two rates here, can you guys give me the cross rate euro versus franc? Okay. So 30 seconds, guys. And when we come back, we discuss the answer. Okay. Okay. Have we got an answer for me? What is the cross rate um, euro versus switch frame? Um, 0 0.6460. 0 yes, exactly. Spot on, right? Thank you so much. Um, who was that? Sorry, I didn't see the participants. Ah, that was Luke. That was me. Okay. Thanks, Luke. Spot on, so that will be 0 0.6460, okay? How did we do that? We take 0.7627 and we divide it by 1.1806, okay? So step one, compute the implicit cross rate. Thanks, Luke. So the answer here is 0 0.6460, okay? So why did I want to compute the cross rate here? Now, we mentioned before that with the arbitrage strategy, right? We want to identify an asset that is priced differently in two markets, yeah? So in this case, we're interested in the value of the franc, okay? So here, I'm just trying to calculate the value of the franc in the euro 
based on the two rates that the first two banks quote, okay? So once I've got this cross rate from my first computation, what I want to do is I want to compare this rate with the direct quote from UBS, okay? So from the question, UBS is quoting a price of um, 0.6395 euro per franc, okay? So do you see why I wanted to calculate the cross right now? I want to compare the price of the franc from the first two banks and the price of the franc from the third bank, okay? So I want to check if these prices are different. If they are different, then I have an arbitrage opportunity, okay? So in this case, as a trader, I observe that um, the price of the franc uh, by UBS is 6395. The, the price of the franc from the first two banks in the euro is actually 6460, right? So there's a discrepancy here, okay? So if there is any discrepancy, um, that means there is mispricing, right? So either the first two banks or the third bank is mispricing the franc. So in this case, what do I want to do? Okay. I want to make profits from this mispricing. Okay. And what do I do? So in an arbitrage strategy, we want to buy low and we want to sell high, okay? If I want to buy low, which rate am I looking at? Am I gonna buy at 6460? I'm gonna buy at 6395. Yep, I've got an answer here, one second. 6395, right, spot on. So if I want to buy the franc, I want to buy low, okay? Um, so I'll be looking at buying the franc at 0.6395 euro, okay? Um, at the same time, I'll be selling the franc for 6460 euro and I will earn the spread in between, okay? So in other words, here what I want to do is I want to buy the franc at the low rate. So this is from UBS, okay? At the same time, I need to sell the franc for the euro indirectly um, at the cross rate, okay? So to get this rate here, I need to sell the franc, I need to exchange the franc for the euro indirectly through the first two banks, okay? So what does that mean? That means I need to trade through the first two banks, okay? So here with my sell transaction, if I'm selling, I'm gonna write a minus sign. And if I'm buy, buying, I'm gonna write a plus sign, okay? So to sell the franc indirectly for the euro, I will be selling the franc um, to acquire the USD first from the first bank at their quoted price. At the same time, I'm going to be buying the euro in exchange for the USD from the second bank at their quoted rate, okay? So one way to check to see if we have set up these indirect transactions correctly is to check the sign, okay? If I need to sell the franc, then in this transaction involving the franc, I need to be selling the franc, okay? At the same time, I'm buying the euro. So in my second transaction involving the euro, I need to be buying the euro, okay? So in other words, um, I can't remember the names of the banks now, but this probably is Dresna, Dresna, and this is probably Credit Suisse, okay? So um, just to summarize, 
these are the three transactions we are looking at for our arbitrage strategy, right? Now, step four, we want to rearrange the transactions to fit with um, the currency that we start with, okay? So in this case, um, if I start with 5 million USD, um, then my first transaction should involve um, using the USD, right? So now I have the USD, I need to be able to use it, okay? So in my first transaction, I should be looking to use the USD. So I'm going to be selling the USD to acquire another currency, okay? So I'm going to look back at the list of transactions I have and find which one um, I will be selling the USD, okay? So transaction one, no. Transaction two, I'm buying the USD. Transaction four, I'm selling the USD for the, pound, for the euro, okay? So as a result, when I start, I'm going to start with this transaction, okay? So I'll be selling the dollar for the euro at this rate from Credit Suisse, I guess. So from 5 million um, USD, if I convert it into the euro, I will take 5 million USD, I times it with the price of each of the USD, okay, in the euro. So after the first transaction is done, I have sold my USD and I have acquired the euro, okay. So that for my second transaction, I will need to somehow use the euro to buy another currency, okay. So I'm selling the euro to buy another currency. So if I look at the two remaining transactions here, um, this one is the one where I use the euro to buy another currency, right? So as a result, my second transaction should be to sell the euro and to buy the franc, okay? So I'm going to take whatever euro I have from the first step, I'm going to convert it into the franc, okay? At this exchange right over here. So once again, after the second transaction, I have acquired the franc. So I've got the franc here, so that in my last transaction, I will be looking to sell the franc, okay? And since I only have one transaction left, I'm just going to write it here, okay? So here I'm selling the franc and I'm acquiring the USD, okay? So I'm converting this much of franc from the from step two to the USD, okay? At this exchange rate here. This is from the question, okay? So now I'm going to check this is my last transaction, right? I've got three and this is my third transaction. I'm gonna check if this transaction have the same currency as what I started with, okay? If you set up this strategy right, then you should end up with the same currency that you started with, okay? So in this case, I started with the USD and therefore I should end up with the USD, okay? Second, um, if I check the final proceeds here, it should be higher than 5 million USD, okay? Which means that I set up the strategy right and therefore I earn a profit, okay? So by definition, an arbitrage strategy should be a zero risk and zero cost strategy, okay? This is very different from when we talk about an investment return, okay? For financial investment, we need to prepare to bear the risk, okay? With arbitrage, it's a mispricing opportunity, and therefore we're talking about a zero risk, zero cost strategy, okay? So to check if, if our strategy is actually zero cost and zero risk, let's check, of, um, let's check our foreign exchange exposure, okay? So here, in this strategy, um, I started with my USD and I end up with USD, okay? So I started with a, um, I started with selling the USD, I end up with buying the USD, okay? 
So in other words, the currency I start with is the same as the currency that I end up with. So I have zero risk exposure here, okay? If I check whether I have any outstanding position for the pounds, sorry, for the euro and the franc, I will see that I do not have any outstanding position for these currencies too, okay? For example, with the euro, here I acquire about 3.8 thousand uh, million euro, but in step one, in step two, I have already got rid of that position, okay? Similarly, with step two, I have acquired a franc, but in step three, I have sold off the franc, okay? So I have already closed off my franc position as well. So in terms of foreign exchange rate risk, I've got zero exposure here. In terms of costs, now I started with 5 million USD, but at the end, I've got 5.05 million, okay? meaning that the cost of starting the strategy could be offset straight away with the final transaction, with the final proceeds, okay? That means at time zero, um, I am not out of pocket anything, okay? Okay, um, with the next question, this question asks us what happens if we initially sell the dollar? for the franc instead, okay? So if we recall from our previous exercise, in this exercise, we have said that these are the three transactions involved, okay? So in terms of the dollar and the franc, this is the direction we want to take. We want to be buying the USD and selling the franc, okay? Oopsie, what happens here? Um, in this case, the question asks us to actually start with selling the dollar to acquire the frame, okay? So essentially, we're saying that um, if we do the reverse of what we did before, what would happen, okay? So if we did the reverse of what we did before, what do you think would happen? Are we going to earn a profit or are we going to expect a loss? So here I'm just going to list out the transactions that we would uh, do if we reverse the order, okay? So if we sell the dollar instead of um, buying the dollar for the franc, okay? So in this case, if I sell the dollar for the franc in step one, in step two, I'll take the franc and I'll sell it to acquire the uh, euro, okay? Then in step three, I will sell the euro that I acquired from step uh, two and I use that to buy back the dollar, okay? So what do we see here? we will end up with a number that is less than 5 million USD, okay? So we still end up with the USD, but we will end up with the loss, okay? So this goes for, um, say, if you go into the exam and you see this question. Now, if your final answer is a loss, then that means you need to go back and reverse the order of your transactions, okay? So when you see a loss in an arbitrage strategy, Maybe that means that you are buying high and you're selling low, okay? So you have taken the opposite direction of what you should have done. Okay. So um, finally, with question three, now this question asks um, what euro frame price would eliminate any triangular arbitrage, okay? In other words, what UBS should be quoting what should UBS be quoting um, in terms of the euro versus the franc for no arbitrage to happen, okay? So if we look back at the um, calculations that we did before, now the first step that we did was 
we compare the write from UBS, which is the direct quote from the market, and the cross rate implied by the first two banks, right? Okay. So in our example, UBS quoted a price of 6395. Oopsie. And in this case, what we did was we arbitrage, okay? So we bought at UBS quoted rate and we sold the franc at the cross rate, okay? Now, what happens if UBS actually quotes a price of 6500? In this case, UBS is pricing the franc too high, okay? So in this case, I can arbitrage as well. I'll be selling the franc to UBS and I'll be buying the franc from this um, cross rate, okay? Which means that every time when the um, market rate is different from the cross rate, there will be arbitrage, okay? And therefore, to eliminate arbitrage, you want to set the market rate to be the same as the cross rate, okay? So if for no arbitrage to happen, the market rate should be the same as the cross rate, okay? So this is the last question for um, the tutorial. I know we didn't go through problem five yet, but you'll find that it's similar to problem six. Now, what I want you to do at home is also, so for problem six and problem five, we started with the USD, right? So at home, when you practice these problems, I also want you to change the currency to a different currency, okay? So for example, in question six, we have the Euro, we have the Franc and we have the USD, okay? We have gone through the exercise for USD. Now I want you to check to change the currency to the Euro and to the Franc and see if you will still get um, an arbitrage profit, all right? So it doesn't matter what currency you start with, you should still end up with a profit, okay? Um, the same goes with question five as well. With question five, you're gonna see the solution for the USD, but I want you to practice with um, the other two currencies as well, okay? Um, we've got two minutes left. Is there any questions that you guys want me to answer, to clarify um, before we conclude? Yes, no. Um, if there is no other question, then I'll conclude the class for now. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for the lecture. Okay. Um, I've got, um, I also uploaded the extra consultation hours for the assignment. So if you guys want to ask anything about the assignment, you're welcome to log in um, at any of these consultation hours. Okay. Um, otherwise, um, see you guys. Have a good evening. Bye, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.